Good evening. Um, big data and data analytics today uh, is largely dominated uh, by computer-generated data, and that's either transactional in nature or social in nature. But as we go forward, um, there is general consensus that there will be a large body of data that will emerge that will be physical data, meaning data that comes from sensors that measure the physical world. Okay. So what can we do with this large body of physical data? We could analyze it uh, in the way we analyze computer transactional data. We could run it through statistical packages and look for patterns, and that would certainly be very helpful and useful. But we could also take this data, given that it is physical data, and run it through physics models to learn a lot more uh, about the environment that they're measuring and give us a lot of useful information. So what do I mean by that? To give you an example, uh, I show you a scenery of uh, waves in an ocean hitting against a rocky outcrop. Um, there's a very nice description that Richard Feynman, the famous physicist, gave in a little poem he wrote at the time that he accepted an award many years back, where he talks about these two sort of independent bodies, waves in an ocean, meeting a hill or a mountain of some kind, and then the two interact to form a surf. So suppose we wanted to predict the formation of this surf. So we could take a bunch of sensors, and let's say these sensors can measure the velocity of the water and the pressure of the water at a certain point. And we took a whole lot of these sensors, so we have a dense uh, uh, number of these sensors, and they're measuring the velocity and the pressure of the water. And let's say we measured the, uh, the shape of this rocky outcrop and its angles and so on with a great degree of precision. And then we took all of this data and we plugged it into some equations that come out of uh, fluid mechanics. And we had a powerful computer, and we solved all of this. We could, today, simulate and predict the way these waves would form, or the way the surf would form, right? Now, this is, of course, not a simulation. It is simply the photograph that I've taken and textured it, as you can make out. But you get the point, right? But this is essentially what is called a cyber-physical system. And if we look at it in a little more detail, it consists of sensors. That you can, which are part of a platform, and you can screw these sensors in and out like light bulbs. They could be measuring various things. They could be satellite data that measures, say, ground cover or agricultural coverage. It could be sensors that measures pollution in cities. It could be sensors that measures your electrical power consumption as a function of time and tries to determine by looking at little blips how many refrigerators you might have. It could be any kind of sensors, right? Now, it all, the data comes into a platform, and then there's now enough advance in wireless technologies that this data can be uploaded uh, with, with high efficiencies to the cloud. And there's enough computing power today, and memory is cheap enough today, that you can then calculate various things using physics models and statistical analytics models to make determinations and recommendations and conclusions that you can push to your smartphone, right? So this is a, a, a cyber-physical system, and you can use that information to better your environment or something. Right? So what is that something? But before I get there, let me talk to you a little bit about the limitations of these systems. These systems today are possible. Right? And largely made possible because the power that exists in your smartphone today is more, the computing power is more than what you had 20 years ago uh, on a graduate student's um, mid-sized server. So you can do a tremendous amount of computation today. Yet, these systems today are kludgy. They're not efficient enough, they're not cheap enough, and the main limitation are the sensors. Okay. They're just not cheap enough, not good enough. But this is how computing was, desktop computing was 30 years from now. And as we go forward in the future, you will see that these systems will become seamless and they will be ubiquitous in our lives. So where would they affect us? Uh, it can have major consequences uh, for things of global impact. And I'd like to give you a couple of examples, one in the area of water quality and one in the area 
of uh, agriculture. And I'd like to point out to you the need for developments in sensing technologies in giving you these examples. So let's start with water, and I will go to the Ganga River in India. It is one of India's two major rivers. About a third of India's population um, is affected by the Ganga, and they live in its basin. Uh, the problem with the Ganga is pollution. It is one of the most polluted rivers in the world, and cleaning it up is one of the major objectives of the current Indian government. There are about 140 drains, or what are called nalas, that feed into the river, and they bring with it um, fecal bacteria, organic matter, and things like fertilizer runoff and industrial pollution. Now, just to give you a sense, the fecal coliform concentrations in the Ganga River run from somewhere between 1,000 to a million per 100 milliliters of water. Now, the safe permissible limit for swimming in a lake in Vermont is about 300 or 400. So that gives you the sense of the level of pollution. Now, let us say we were able to be able to measure fecal bacteria or organic matter using a measurement known as biochemical oxygen demand. And today there are techniques for measuring these, but to be able to measure them accurately, these tests take at least a couple of days. But let's say we were able to make sensors okay, that could measure these instantaneously, and they were cheap. Let's say they cost about 100 rupees, so a couple of dollars. Then we could be measuring this river with high density, with high resolution, and this data, if it could be sent cheaply up to the cloud, it could be analyzed, and we could use things like computational fluid dynamic models and so on, not just to predict the flow in future of these contaminants, but also to do things like inverse modeling to back predict and try to find out sources of contamination. Say it could be a sewage treatment plant that wasn't working right, or say it could be an industry that was, uh, was, was not following uh, regulations uh, for, for dumping pollutants. So there could be so many different things that could be done if only we could make these systems, these sensing systems, cheap enough so that they could be usable worldwide. Okay. So water quality is a major area where sensors and sensing systems and cyber physical systems will make a huge difference. The second example is one of agriculture. Now, as many of you are probably aware, water is overused in agriculture, okay? Uh, it's not measured accurately. Uh, farmers kind of guess as to how much water they need to use, and this is a global phenomenon. About 70% of fresh water consumption in the world is due to agriculture. Now, this is an experiment that scientists in IBM and Gallo Wineries did, and I was uh, fortunate to have played a small role in this experiment while I was at IBM. So the role of this experiment was to try to find out if one could improve yields and increase the water efficiency and therefore reduce um, the usage of water. So as a test bed, about a 10-acre plot, a vineyard in Lodi, California, was chosen. This vineyard was, we, we divided it up into little tiles that were about 30 by 30 meters, and we rigged up the irrigation in such a way that the water delivery could be individually controlled to each tile, okay? So now, during harvest season, the team regularly monitored satellite images of this, uh, this control region, and these satellite images are free. They're available from the U.S. government. You can open an account and download it. It's available in 11 color bands, and you can use this data to basically look at the greening of the vineyard canopy, basically look at a chlorophyll map. So then the scientists analyzed this chlorophyll map. They got climate data, weather data, et cetera, and then they calculated exactly how much water should be delivered to each of those little tiles. And when they did that, over a two-year period, two harvest seasons, they found that the yields and water efficiencies went up by about 10 to 20 percent. And this was huge. This was a wonderful result because conceptually, 
all that was done was very simple. We used free satellite data to calculate the amount of water and then dose it accordingly. Now, let us say we were able to have sensors that could go into the ground that measured things like dissolved nitrates, that measured things like soil moisture or water potential, that measured things like um, plant disease, then we could similarly calculate much more accurately the amount of water, fertilizer, and pesticide that would be needed. And we estimate that there could be savings of you know, things like you know, two to five times savings of these resources. So what is the problem? Right? A lot of these sensors are available today, but they are, again, very, very expensive. They cost a sensing platform today. Here will cost you somewhere between $800 to $2,000. So even for a high-value crop like wine grapes, you cannot afford to put more than maybe one sensing platform or maybe a couple every acre. But you need them to be there about 10 meters apart because that is sort of the length scale of soil variability. So these sensors need to come down in, in, in factors of about 10 to 100 in price for them to be usable. But once that happens, it will change agriculture. So again, it points to the need for sensors. So how can we improve these sensors, make them more cost efficient and more power efficient? And the answer, I believe, lies in the area of nanotechnology. Nanotechnology has been around for about 25 years or so, and a lot has been learned in the field. But I believe sincerely that the calling card of nanotechnology will be in what it does for sensors. Okay. And the reason is very simple over here. Uh, the picture you're seeing here is a nanoparticle of platinum. Nanomaterials are essentially very small chunks of materials that are just a handful of atoms, maybe a you know, tens of atoms or hundreds of atoms, or at the most, maybe thousands of atoms, right? And if there's one message I'd like you to go home with is that nanoparticles have many different properties, but the most important property is that its, its uniqueness lies in the fact that its property is determined by the environment that it is in. Okay. It's, for instance, if I take a bulk material, if I take this table, its property is determined by the way its atoms are bonded and so on. But when a particle is very, very small, how it behaves is determined entirely by the environment it is in. And this is important when you're trying to make a sensor because you want something that senses the environment. Right? And that is why these materials are ideal for sensors. So, how would we make a sensor out of these nanomaterials? Well, they interact in different ways with light, with magnetic fields, as you saw in David's talk, um, with, uh, with, with pressures. And let me just give you one small example here, again, going back to water, and in this case, let's say, determination of dissolved oxygen in water. So, this is a technology that is already there. It's relatively new. Um, you can buy products. It essentially is, a, is, is using something called a fluorophore, which absorbs light. In this case, it's absorbing blue light, and it emits red light. Now, if there is dissolved oxygen in water, and if this fluorophore is dipped in water, then this oxygen quenches or kills this light. Now, you could buy 50 cents worth light-emitting diodes, and detectors, and therefore very quickly measure this level of quenching or killing of the fluorescence and determine how much oxygen is there. This is a very simple idea. It's a product. It's one of the sort of early products of what I would call nanotechnology, and you will only see these types of products improve and become cheaper and more efficient over the years. So where is the future headed? And for this, I would like to give the example of the Boquilla vine. This is a vine that is found in Chile, and it is a, it is a very interesting plant. When this vine grows on any tree, uh, the leaves of this vine try to mimic the shape of the, tree, of the leaves of the tree that it is growing on. Now, this is amazing, because the vine cannot see in, in the common way that we define seeing. So obviously, it is sensing something in a distributed way, 
and then changing the shape of its leaves. Right? This is sort of the ultimate cyber physical system. It is adaptive sensing, it is distributed sensing, and in many ways this is sort of the early form of intelligence. So we look at today's cyber physical systems and push it out, you know, 20, 30, 40 years from now, that's where our systems will be. They'll be distributed computing systems and you will start seeing the first things of what we would call intelligence. With that, I would conclude my talk. Thank you.